Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God spoke these words and said, I am the Lord, your God. You shall have, have no other gods but me. Lord, Lord have, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Lord, Lord have, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Lord, Lord have, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. Honor your father and your mother. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not murder. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these same laws in our hearts.
be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Look with compassion upon the heartfelt desire of your servants, and purify our disordered, disordered affections, that we may behold your eternal glory in the face of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Exodus. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I now I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sight for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people of Egypt, the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, God, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, and he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also sent, said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord of the God, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. 
within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sin and heals all your infirmities? Who saves your life from the pit and crowns you with mercy and loving kindness? Who satisfies you with good things, renewing youth like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all those who are oppressed with wrong. He showed his ways to Moses, his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, long-suffering and of great goodness. He will not always chide us, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins or rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy also toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. A reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as, as examples for us, that we, may not, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and... 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. For you, Lord Christ. There were some present at the very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And he said these things. As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'd like to tell you about a guy I know named Rick Kramer. <laughs> now, the first thing you got to know about Rick is that he's a big guy. I mean, he's probably 6'7", weighs close to 400 pounds. And when I talk to him, I have to make sure I use small words, because let's face it, the guy is not a rocket scientist. <laughs> But it's okay, because he makes up for it by being really mean and nasty most of the time. Now, most of you probably know Rick already, and you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, that's not who Rick is, and you would be absolutely right. It's not. And even if I wanted these things to be true about him, I can't make him into something he's not. And yet... We try to do that with God all the time. 
Now, for some, God is all about just love and acceptance, like this overindulgent grandparent that wants to make us happy and give us whatever we want. But for others, God is the supreme taskmaster, imposing impossible rules onto us and then punishing us when we fall short. But for the most part, these understandings of God are nothing more than our own projections, and they really say more about us than they do about God. <clears throat> now, going back to Rick, we know that the things that I said about him are not true because we know who he is. We've spent time with him. We've talked to him, and he has revealed himself to us in his behavior and his words and his actions. Now, if we want to know who God is, we need to do it in the same way. And the primary way that God reveals himself to us today is through his holy scripture. Now, unfortunately for guys like Moses, scripture hasn't always been around. And so God has had to reveal himself in different ways in times past. And today's reading from Exodus is just such an example. When God appears to Moses in the burning bush, he reveals a great deal of information about his own character and nature. And these 15 verses that we read today are so dense that we could really do a six-week Bible study on them. But... For the sake of time today, I'd like to focus simply on what I like to call the three C's of God. So those three C's are God comes to us, God cares for us, and God craves a relationship with us. So today we're going to take a look at each one of those in turn. So the first C is that God comes to us. Now let's look at this story of God's people. Let's look at the story of God's people up until this point in Scripture. In last week's Old Testament lesson, we heard about God coming to Abraham. And he made two promises to Abraham. He promised him land, and he promised him offspring. And although the land portion of this promise is yet to be fulfilled, the descendants part has. The children of Abraham have become the people of Israel, but they find themselves now enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Now remember, there's no Bible or Torah at this time. There are no churches or synagogues in Egypt. So little is known about the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now Moses, of course, as we know, grew up in the household of Pharaoh. And so it's likely that he's more familiar with the Egyptian gods than the God of his people. When Moses flees to Egypt, he meets Jethro, a priest of Midian, and marries his daughter Zipporah. And he works tending his father-in-law's sheep. And although we know that Jethro is a priest, <clears throat> it seems unlikely that he was a priest of the Hebrew God. But later in chapter 18, he will declare, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Now all of this to say that at this point for Moses, and really for everyone else, the Lord is still somewhat of a mystery. They don't truly know who he is. <clears throat> and just as he did with Abraham hundreds of years before, God will now initiate a relationship with Moses. He comes to him in the form of a burning bush, and he draws Moses to himself. He calls Moses by name, and he tells him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We worship a God who comes to us. He doesn't hide himself and wait to be discovered, but instead he is the initiator of the relationship with his creation. 
God always makes the first move. Nowhere is this more evident than in the sending of Jesus. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he waited for the world to come to him. Right? No. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And just as the Lord initiates the exodus of Israel by sending his servant Moses back to Egypt, God the Father initiates the salvation of mankind by sending his son Jesus into the world to die for our sins and then to rise to new life in his kingdom. In the same way, God initiates a relationship with each one of us. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul tells us that the Lord chose us in him before the foundations of the world. And in 1 John 4.19, we are told that we love because he first loved us. Think for a minute about a public figure that you admire or respect. Now, it could be an author, a theologian, an athlete, or a musician. For many of us, we would be willing to travel long distances and wait in long lines just for a chance to meet that person, to shake their hands and say hello. But what if that person were to intentionally seek you out? What if that person were to come to your house and to wait in line just to meet you? (laughs) Now, it might be hard to imagine someone doing that for you, But that is exactly the God of the universe does. Now the second C that we're going to look at today is that God cares for us. Starting in verse 7 of our reading today, the Lord tells Moses why he has come to him. He says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their crying because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, when I lived in Missouri, there was a notorious slumlord named Chris Gatley who at one time owned over 500 properties in and around the Springfield area. Now, had Mr. Gatley been a benevolent individual, this might not have been a problem, but he was not. He routinely ignored requests and complaints from his tenants. He refused to do basic upkeep and maintenance on his properties, and he managed to dodge numerous city nuisance complaints. He simply didn't care about the people living in his properties. And he wanted nothing to do with them other than collecting their rent checks. Now, unfortunately, many people today see God in this same way as this absentee landlord who is completely uninvolved with his creation. But that is simply not true. He not only hears the cries of his people, but he does something about it. He comes to Moses and he sends him to Egypt to rescue them. And through signs and wonders, he brings his people out of Egypt. He rescues them from Pharaoh's army and then he sustains them in the wilderness. Even when they start to complain and worship idols, God continues to care for them and he eventually brings them into the promised land. Now, this exodus foreshadows an even greater exodus when God sends his only son to rescue us from sin and death and to bring us into the promised land of his kingdom. Now, this is not an unloving, uncaring God, but rather a God who cares so deeply and so profoundly for us that he is willing to sacrifice his own son so that we might be reconciled to him. 
Many of you have probably heard me talk about Don Armstrong, who was my rector when I was in Colorado Springs. Don and I worked together for almost 14 years. And during that time, we developed a really close relationship. And I knew that Don cared deeply for me, not because he gave me attaboys and took me skiing, which he did and I loved. (laughs) But the way I knew that Don truly cared for me was because he was willing to sacrifice for me. One time when our finances were lean, Don actually took a pay cut so that I wouldn't have to. And when we could only afford to fund a retirement plan for one of us, he let it be my retirement plan. Those are just a couple of examples, but they make the point that when we care about someone, we are willing to give something up for them. You see, God does not need us in order to be God. He's not somehow incomplete if he doesn't have us, and he's not lonely without us. And yet, he was willing to give his only son to die on the cross for our sake. Now, although it may seem like we are surrounded in the world by unloving and uncaring people, we must always remember that the God of the universe cares for us more than we could ever know, and he is willing to go to the ends of the earth to be reconciled to us. The final C today is that God craves a personal relationship with us. An interesting exchange happens starting in verse 13 of our reading. Moses says to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? This is way more than just a practical question. In the ancient world, to know someone's name meant that you had power over them. In a lot of ways, that really hasn't changed today. Any of you guys remember the TV show, The Brady Bunch? (laughs) I I figured this crowd, you guys would know The Brady Bunch. (laughs) So in The Brady Bunch, what was the housekeeper's name? Alice. Alice. And everyone called her Alice. Even the kids, even little Thindy Brady called her Alice. But what did Alice call the parents? Mr. and Mrs. Brady. She never called them Mike and Carol. And so no matter how much they wanted to talk about how Alice was really a part of the family, that mere fact that she could not call them by name really defined the truth of that relationship. Well, in Genesis 29, uh, after Jacob wrestles with God, remember the Lord changes Jacob's name to Israel. But when Jacob asks for God's name, the Lord simply replies by saying, why is it that you ask my name? (laughs) He doesn't get an answer. However, the Lord responds to the same request by Moses, By saying, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So not only does he tell Moses his name, he tells Moses to reveal this name to the people of Israel as well. And this is a sign of the intimacy between God and his people. That they can call him by name And he calls us into that same intimate relationship. The God of the universe calls each one of us by name. And he bids us to do the same with him. He's not this nameless, faceless energy force, but rather he is a personal being that wants to relate to each one of us in an intimate and personal way. And that means we can approach him without reservation. We don't need to have our people go and talk with his people and set something up. 
but rather we can go directly to him with our prayers and with our praises. And he is ready to receive us and welcome us into his presence. Now, going back to my opening illustration, imagine that this is your first time at Christ the King, and we invite you out to lunch after church. And we tell you, just find Rick, and he will give you a ride to the restaurant. But if you use my description of who Rick is, you're never going to find him because you're going to be looking for someone else and you're never going to make it to lunch. In a similar fashion, if we are called to draw others to God, we need to make sure we know who, uh, who he has revealed himself to be lest we lead ourselves and others astray. The Bible is the account of God's revelation of himself to us. And it is through these pages that we come to know who he is, his character, and his nature. And from our lesson today, we know that God comes to us. We know that God cares for us. And we know that God craves a relationship with us. And these attributes are on full display, not only in this story in Exodus, but throughout the entirety of Scripture, and especially in the life and work of Jesus Christ himself. So if you haven't done so already, make this the day that you receive the God who comes to you, that you embrace the God who cares for you, and that you call out to the God whose name you know. He stands at the door of your heart and knocks, ready to welcome you into his kingdom. So come and join him today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, and through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the whole world, saying, Hear our prayer. After each of the biddings, I will pause and give you a chance to pray aloud or in quiet as you wish. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our for fully your archbishop and chief our bishop and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation.
Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Joe, our president, Devin, our governor, and Steve, our mayor. Lord, in your mercy. For all the abundant blessings of this life, we thank you, O oh Lord. We remember especially those who celebrate birthdays and anniversaries this week. Please add your own thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. For those who travel this week, that they might be protected from every danger. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Today we pray especially for Mac, Darlene, Jeremy, Patrick, and Lee Ruth, Teresa, Vincent, Dolores, Laura Lee, Ruth, Sally, Linda, Ben, Helen, Molly, Logan, Tim, and Martin. Please add the names of anyone you wish to pray for today. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection and thanksgiving, let us pray. Please name any who have died that you wish to remember today. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
welcome to Christ the King. If you're visiting with us today, we're excited to have you here. If you'd like any more information on Christ the King, you can fill out one of our Connect cards and uh, just hand it to me on your way out or leave it on that table back there. Please know that all baptized Christians who come to faith and repentance in Jesus Christ are invited to receive Holy Communion today. To receive, you'll simply come forward when invited and two hands together and we will intake, which is our fancy Anglican way of saying dip, the host in the wine and place it in your hands. If you'd like to receive the host without having it uh, intincted, simply one hand across your chest and one hand forward and to receive a blessing, two hands across your chest. And now do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also.
It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. That fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven to forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Likewise, do this and do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, <clears throat> and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, "Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me." Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your everlasting kingdom for we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, mighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and we feed on him in your hearts by faith for thanksgiving. Amen.
sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries. We are earthly allies of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. 
Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Nice to see everyone here today. <laughs> so a few quick announcements. Um, as we get closer and closer to Holy Week and Easter, one of the things I want to remind everyone of is making room for visitors and guests, uh, especially Easter Sunday. And so I know this is hard to hear, but especially on Easter, if if the, the family of Christ the King could move forward and to the outer parts of the, the pews to make room for visitors and guests, that would be wonderful. So if you want to practice doing that in the coming weeks, it may take a few weeks to kind of get used to that. Um, but what we don't want is someone coming in uh, maybe at the last minute not being able to find somewhere to sit. So, so forward and towards the walls, and then we leave lots of room for visitors and guests. Um, now, with that being said, if we're going to get lots of visitors and guests, we have some new postcards, and these contain a list of all of our Holy Week services and our Easter service with a map on the back. So we've got a bunch back there. We've got some on the welcome table, so take some, hand them out to friends, neighbors, strangers, whoever you meet, uh, invite them to come and join us for Holy Week and Easter. Now, Holy Week is important. Uh, so often we, we do Palm Sunday, and then we don't come to church again until Easter, and then we miss everything that happens in between. And really, this is the big week of the Christian year. Uh, so, Monday, Thursday, we will be having a service at 7 o'clock that evening where we remember the institution of the Last Supper and Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. So, that will be Monday, Thursday. Good Friday, we remember his crucifixion with Stations of the Cross at noon, and then the Good Friday liturgy at 7, and then uh Holy Saturday, we celebrate the great vigil of Easter, where we will gather. So, so the Monday, Thursday, the service begins in light and ends in darkness. Good Friday, it is darkness. Uh, the Easter vigil, you start in darkness, you kindle the new flame, and then you bring light into the church, and you light the church. Um, we hear the story of salvation in Scripture, and then the lights come on, we have the Easter uh, acclamation, and we celebrate the first Eucharist of Easter um, at the vigil. So, um, so it's, it's all a progression, and it all builds on itself. So please make plans, if you can, to come to all of those services. If you need a ride, let us know, and I'm sure we can find people to give rides to it for those who aren't able to drive at night. Um, but don't don't miss out on everything because the glory of Easter makes so much more sense if we've come through Holy Week uh, before that. Um, but take take one of these for yourself and pin it up on your refrigerator or wherever so you can remember all of our different services uh, throughout Holy Week. And then finally, our Foundations for Faith class this coming uh, Wednesday, I think we're, we're all set for soup. Lee is bringing soup. And Rick, are you bringing your soup too? Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> I, okay, I'll remind me and check that. Um, but the, the soup has been really good, so come and join us for soup. And then for class this week, um, in preparation for class, read section three of the catechism. Um, that's right. That's there. You go. I'm not sure that's what scripture was talking about, though. Drat. Um, 
so, so make plans to join us for Foundations for Faith. It's, it's been a wonderful time of fellowship and learning and kind of talking with each other and training for taking the gospel out into the world. And with that being said, uh, this is the time of our service where we do our EMPs, which is not an electromagnetic pulse. It is how we engage with our community, uh, met the needs of others, and proclaimed the gospel. Peter. And we're... And we're going to mic you. <laughs> I'm Irish. I don't need a mic. <laughs> I have a pack. Uh, the, the computer people want to be able to hear you. <laughs> you can sit down. Uh, this is Nancy's testimony, but she's too humble to get up here and talk. Yesterday was Sir Ramona. It's a community cleanup day, but more than that, it's a Christian fellowship day. Sir Ramona is an economical group, I hope I said that correctly. So there are about six or seven churches that get together. And remember at Christmas time, we make bags for the homeless and uh, get gifts for the homeless family's children. And then this time, it's cleaning up. It was, thank God it didn't rain. It was a beautiful day. And we, Nancy and I, we cleaned up between uh, Manana's and the music store. But on Main Street, here was all these families, young children, cleaning up. And then we met at uh, the park. There's only one park in Ramona. And uh, they cleaned the garden club area. The... Junior ROTC was there from high school, a Boy Scout troop. And we weren't creating Christians. We were living life as Christians. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Nancy. And before I give Leah the mic back, <laughs> Wally and Judy, 52 years this week. Nancy and I, 48 years this week. Thanks, Peter. Any other testimonies? Sue's got one. Um, it's just a short one, but um, the EMP is kind of kind of on my brain now since you've been bringing it up every week. And so I was going to the grocery store and I was driving through, you know, and I was trying to find a parking spot. And I saw a couple of people and I think they were playing music or something. And then I went over and parked and I went in and came out and I went, wow. Is that them, or was that the music that the, the shopping centers just decided to play? Because it was, like, amazing. So I said, wait a minute. And so I went around when I left and kind of went around, and I saw them. And I said, I parked, and I stopped, and I got out, and I gave them some money first. And um, they, were, they needed money for food and living expenses and so on and so forth. So we introduced each other, and um, the young man, it was a mother and son, but he was a grown son, and he said he's a Christian. And so I said, well, well, can I pray for you? And they went, oh, yes. So they were very happy about it. I mean, so it was just really great, you know, that I was able to think about that, and I don't know if I would have stopped otherwise. So it was wonderful. So you've got it on my mind now. So <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> well, well, praise God. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is normalize this kingdom behavior of engaging the community, meeting the needs of others, and proclaiming the gospel. Doyle. I need this. Am I on? Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, I've been a member of the church since 2010. And I came here through an accidental conversation with Alicia and I with neighbors down the street who uh, were members here, um, Angus and Nancy McDonald. And so I started going, and so I met uh, Father Russell. And in my friendship with Father Russell, uh, he, he learned that I used to be the head chaplain for the sheriff's department <laughs> over all their detention facilities. And so... Uh, in 2007, I left that role, but then he said, well, wait a minute. We have people that go down to Donovan. And so in 2019, in July, I joined him there, and then he became full-time chaplain at the, the Donovan, and so I started going in 
But then in March of uh, 20, COVID hit. And all our chaplains, 42 of them, were no longer allowed to come inside. Um, so it's been now two years. And I got a call, and I've been sharing this with Father Larry, that the new chaplain asked me to come back into Echo Yard to, to deliver courses of a professor to, to, to the inmates. So next Saturday, um, I'm gonna go in and we have about 20 men who want to receive an undergraduate degree in seminary, and so I'm teaching college-based courses. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So I'm here to say thank you to the Lord, because I thought when I left the jail system, I was done. <laughs> no, you're never done with the Lord. <laughs> he has his perfect timing, and our relationships are so precious to him because he uses others to bless us. So I just want us to do a shout out to this church, to Larry, to the leadership and everybody who I feel like I'm remade new because now I'm able to go back with the love that I have to share God's love with them. And these are not nice people. <laughs> but you'll never hear people sing louder with such great love as you can with these men. Mother Teresa has a saying. She comes when, when you know you come to the end of yourself and your nothingness frightens you. Look over and see Jesus smiling. <laughs> and it's true with them. And uh, I wish you could go inside, but it's, I have 11 gates I have to go through to get inside. But when I head towards that first gate, I feel the Lord's presence. <laughs> and I've had even guards come up to me one-on-one -on -one and say, I want to accept Jesus. <laughs> so you just, you just don't know who, you know, who's hurting. But anyway, but anyway I talked too long. Thank you. So. All right, well, if we would all stand, let us sing together our closing hymn, Thou Whose Almighty Word. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.